started. Um, Tyrone, you can go to the next slide, please. Welcome to the Field Sampling Procedures Manual update for uh, Chapter 2. Thank you for bearing with us through some of our uh, technical issues this morning. So, you know, we're two years into this and still there are some hiccups along the way with uh, virtual training. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, my name is Alyssa Ambacher, and I'm going to be moderating today with Lynn Mitchell. Uh, we are with the training committee. Uh, Tyrone, next slide, please. I know a lot of you are here for continuing education credits today. The SRP licensing board has approved 1.5 technical CECs for this class. Um, you must be logged in for the entire session and there will be two poll questions inserted in this training because it's a short training and you should answer both of those. Um, next slide, please. All right, so in order to get your CECs, uh, DEP will compile a list of everyone who's eligible for CECs from today's training, and we will give that list to the LSRPA. And then the LSRPA will email you a link to access your certificate um, if you are eligible. And then the certificates will be issued by the LSRPA after you pay a $25 processing fee. Next slide, please. So if you've done these trainings with us before, you know we have our test your knowledge slides. Here's what they look like. This is just an example. Um, so there are 30 days in March, true or false. Next slide, please. And the answer is false. If you checked the date today, it's the 31st. Um, next slide, please. So questions will be read aloud by the moderators um, as time permits. We will try to get to everybody's questions. Um, if we can't, we will reply via email to the person who asked the question. Next slide, please. Um, please use the chat function to inform us if you have any technical issues with the presentation um, and don't use them for comments on the presentation um, or to answer anybody else's questions. Um, just use it to let us know if you have any problems. Next slide, please. And remember, please fill out the course evaluation. Um, the link will be put into the chat momentarily. Um, and we appreciate all of your feedback. Um, next slide, please. At this point, I, I'd like to introduce Cassidy. Thank Cassidy, you so much. Can you put on, we don't see you, Cassidy. Yep, it's there you coming go. up. There you go, okay. Good morning, everybody. So again, welcome to uh, another great course. We're looking at updates to chapter two of the Field Sampling Procedures Manual. Next slide, please. Uh, from the LSRPA, we'd like to thank our our sponsors, our diamond partners, our platinum partners, as well as our academic institutional partner, Rutgers. Uh, our gold partners as well. And our silver partners. So we have some great upcoming courses and events. On April 19th, we have our regulatory roundtable addressing sediment contamination under the LSRP program. On the 20th, we have a course, uh, Due Diligence in New Jersey. That one is always very popular. And then on the 17th of May, we have our another regulatory roundtable regarding REOs um, with some important tips. So please take a look at our website and um, sign up. And of course, we have our big event coming up in June, 14th and 15th, our annual site remediation conference. Um, please sign up to uh, take a look at our courses as well as um, catch up with friends. It's been a while. And uh, some general notes. As always, respond to your poll questions. If you don't, you're not going to get your CECs. If you have questions, use the chat feature. And then um, as was stated, there will be a link for the online evaluation at the end of the training. Make sure 
you let us know how it went, what we can improve on, what future courses you'd like to see, et cetera. We have a social media presence, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Feel free to go on there, and engage with us through these platforms. Uh, we use these platforms as well to post about upcoming courses. And again, thank you so much from the LSRPA. Enjoy the course. All right, thank you so much, Cassidy. Um, up next, we have Crystal to get into the field sampling procedures manual. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being here today. My name is Crystal Perozic, and I work for the DEP in the Bureau of Site Management, and I am also the co-chair of the committee. Next slide. This is a list of all of the committee members from the DEP. Next slide. And these are all of our stakeholder committee members. Next slide. The field sampling procedures manual was originally written in 1992. It was to promote accuracy and consistency and discuss how environmental samples are collected and analyzed. This document was only available in paper form. Next slide. In 2005, we did an update and this was the first electronic copy. Next slide. Since 2005, we've had minor updates, uh, minor text uh, clarification. And if you go to the link on the screen on the DEP website, you can see a list of all of the updates that have been completed. Next slide. So we formed the committee in 2017, and our goal was to update every chapter of the manual. Next slide. Along the way, we've also updated the webpage, and they will put the link to the webpage in the chat so everybody can take a look, but on the right-hand side of the site, you'll see is the links to the original document. And then on the left side is all of the links to what we've updated so far. Next slide. We also added a glossary link to the site, and this will be the glossary link for all of the manual as well as the acronyms. And the acronyms list is also for the whole DEP, for all of our um, training, all of our, all of our site. This is the full acronyms list that we've been updating. And they'll post those links in the chat also for you guys. Next slide. So this is a list of all of the chapters that are in the manual. Next slide. So how we did this is we have 32 people in our committee, which is rather large. So we broke it down into work groups for each chapter that we were updating. Um, once the work group was done with their update, it was then given to the full committee for review and comment before it was given out to stakeholders and DEP for review. Next slide. Our first work group was for chapters one, three, and four. This was a list of everybody that was in that work group, DEP and stakeholders. Next slide. Um, the list of everything for chapter one. Next slide. Uh, chapter one is the sampling plan. It gives an objective of the sampling. It dictates the plan. Um, it tells you different site-specific information that is useful to consider, like the history, the physical environment, sample locations. This chapter didn't need a full update. We did what was needed, but it, it's nothing that needed training. So we're not doing a specific training for all of chapter one. So if anybody has any questions on chapter one, you can feel free to email me. Next slide. Chapter three was gaining entry to inspect sites. And chapter three was written as an internal DEP process for gaining entry to inspect sites. So this chapter was no longer needed in the manual and it was removed. Next slide. Chapter four 
was site entry activities. Next slide. This discusses how to establish a health and safety program for the site. And again, this didn't need too many updates, so we're not doing a full training on this chapter. But if you do have questions, feel free to email me. Next slide. Our next work group was for chapter two. This is a list of the chapter two work group members. Next slide. And the layout of chapter two. Next slide. 2.1 is the introduction, and it basically just says that it provides the user with the QA requirements and procedures for conducting environmental measurements and sampling. It discusses elements highlighted in the quality assurance project plan and why we need to follow it. And we also give a list of relevant guidance manuals and links. Next slide. And next is Ryan Laram from the DEP. Thank you so much, Crystal. All right, Ryan, whenever you're ready. All right, good morning. I'm Ryan Laram from the NJDEP Office of Quality Assurance, where we administer the laboratory certification program. And I'm going to be discussing section 2.2 and 2.3. Next slide. Section 2.2 is laboratory certifications. This includes field and environmental measurement certifications. Section 2.3 is data quality objectives. Also includes laboratory analytical methods and field screening methods. Next slide. So what's changed in these sections? Generally, we've added detail and reorganized information within and between sections into a more logical order but overall the information is still similar. For example, in the prior version, lab certification was only addressed in a subsection of chapter two's introduction. Lab certification now has its own section. More hyperlinks have been added to keep up with changing science, mandates, and regulations. We wanna ensure that users of the guidance manual have access to the most real-time information as possible and provide up-to-date references and links. Some wording has been changed to make explanations as clear as possible. Next slide. Section 2.2, certifications. As I mentioned, lab certification now has its own section as the work group felt that this matter needed to be further elaborated on. Under the new section, the user will find information regarding the different types of certification the NJDEP Office of Quality Assurance, or OQA, offers. In the prior version, only the NELAP program was mentioned, but the Environmental Laboratory Certification Program, or ELCP, which is New Jersey's state certification program, was not included. Both programs are now mentioned in the updated version, and a hyperlink to the NJELCP rules has been added. Laboratories may obtain certification from the OQA within either of these programs, but they must hold certification through one of them. Next slide. Certification is analyte method matrix specific. So for example, if a lab is certified by a method for a specific parameter in soil, that doesn't mean that they can also analyze that parameter in wastewater, that would be a separate certification. Remember field environmental measure measurements and environmental laboratories submitting analytical data to the NJDEP, regardless of data quality level must be certified. An environmental laboratory is defined as any laboratory, facility, consulting firm, local government, or private agency, business entity, or other person that the DEP has authorized to generate analytical data. A link to the regulations governing the certification of laboratories and environmental measurements has been included. All certified laboratories must adhere to these regulations, federal regulations, and method-specific requirements found within the methods for which they are certified. Next slide. The certification status of a laboratory must be determined prior to submitting environmental samples for analysis. A link to the laboratory certification webpage has been included, and through that webpage, Data Miner 2.0 can be accessed. 
Data Miner allows the user to search for environmental laboratories based on their location and certification status, such as by a specific method or for a specific analyte. When in doubt, contact the laboratory to confirm that they can meet your needs. Next slide. Section 2.2.1, Field Environmental Measurement Certifications. As I stated, certification is required for measurements collected in the field and submitted to the DEP. In the prior version, laboratory certification applicable to field measurements, such as analyze immediately, immunoassay, and low flow sampling and analysis was found in several places. In the updated manual, everything related to lab certification is pulled together under the same section. Next slide. Details on certification requirements specific to low flow sampling and analysis have been added to section 2.2.1. The work group did this mainly so that consultants and other users of the manual understand that certification is required for all parameter testing applicable to low flow analysis. A brief description of the process to gain certification for these field measurements has been included. Hyperlinks have also been added to provide more information related to low flow sampling, as well as instrument calibration forms and data sheets. Next slide. Section 2.3. Data quality objectives. The old manual used the term data quality levels. These are now referred to as data quality objectives. Data quality objectives are developed by the investigator to ensure that a sufficient quantity and quality of analytical data are generated to meet the goals of the project and support defensible conclusions that protect human health and the environment. Data quality objectives must take analytical method sensitivity and method selection into account. A link to EPA guidance on the data quality objectives process has been included. Next slide. Remember, any sampling conducted by remediation professionals and state contract vendors requires the development and implementation of a quality assurance project plan. The plan should address site-specific data quality objectives, sample collection and handling procedures, and field quality control samples, as well as analytical methods to be used, target analytes, reporting levels, lab certification, and lab quality control samples. Data deliverables should also be addressed. Links to quality assurance project plan guidance have been added. Next slide. 2.3.1, laboratory analytical methods. Appropriate methods must be chosen based on the nature of work being performed and any method specific sample requirements must be taken into consideration. The section includes links where approved methodology may be found. Approved methods are analyte and matrix specific. Samples must be collected in accordance with applicable regulatory requirements. However, be sure to also consult the analytical method for additional sample requirements such as more stringent holding times or quality control sample collection procedures. And we'll hear more about quality control sample collection later. Next slide. 2.3.2, field screening methods. This topic was not mentioned in the previous field sampling procedures manual, but our work group felt that it was important enough to include in the updated version. In this section, the reader will find information pertaining to some programmatic types of field screening procedures and tools. Also listed are a few factors to consider before using field screening methods. Next slide. So in conclusion, remember that the field sampling procedures manual provides sampling guidance and should not be viewed as the final say it's designed to complement, not replace or supersede program-specific technical guidance or other regulatory requirements. And remember that certification is analyte, method, and matrix specific, and all regulatory data reported to the state must be from a laboratory which holds certification for the analytical method used. Be sure to consult the methodology for the testing being conducted for method-specific requirements that may differ from the guidance in the field sampling manual. 
In addition to consulting the analytical method, remember, consult NGDEP program requirements and federal requirements related to your project. And finally, remember to plan ahead. With any project, please create the project plan with enough time for all approvals, sign-offs, scheduling matters, equipment gathering, et cetera, to be completed before the start of the project. And that concludes 2.2 and 2.3. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, up next, we have Eileen Snyder. Trying to... Let me see. Trying to click the camera. Oh, there, there we go. go. There we go. Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eileen Snyder. I'm with Alpha Analytical. And as the laboratory representative on the committee, I will be your guide for this segment of the program. So our topic will be section 2.4 of the guide, sample containers and sample preservation requirements. Next slide. Sample. Section 2.4 of the Field Sampling Procedures Manual includes eight subsections and references five appendices. These are listed in the slide here and will provide our agenda for this segment of the program. Next slide. So here's your key takeaway. Why are we talking about all of this? Sample integrity is based on all of the measures that we'll discuss in section 2.4 beginning with the selection of the container and the container composition. The integrity of the sample is maintained both chemically and physically when all of these measures are undertaken. Next slide. The sample container type is based on several, faction, several factors. First, the sample matrix, whether it's solid, liquid, waste, biota, tissue, etc. Secondly, the sample constituents, waste, solvents, plasticizers, etc. Third, the analytical methods used to determine the constituents in that sample, such as organics, metals, etc. And fourth, the regulatory program under which the activity is being taken, drinking water, non-potable water, wastewater, water and waste. Next slide. What are the factors that affect container choices? Containers include both glass and plastic. Coloring may differ from amber to opaque. Next slide. So here's a view inside the laboratory of a variety of containers typically used for collection of environmental samples, both liquid and solid samples of different types. Next slide. Sample container types are broken down into two basic types, glass containers and plastic containers. The glass containers are typically amber and they're used for collection of photosensitive constituents. Glass itself is chemically inert to most substances. So the glass amber containers are typically used for sampling potentially hazardous material and most organic analytical parameters in both solid and liquid matrices. Plastic containers typically come in opaque uh, or non-see-through uh, coloring. Plastic containers of the high-density polyethylene type are used for sampling metals, general chemistry, and PFAS analytical parameters in both solid and liquid matrices. The plastic container itself has anti-reactivity properties. Next slide. Okay, so we have our first test your knowledge question. I hope everyone's paying attention. For sample container selection, one, what factors should be considered? A, sample matrix, B, analytical methods, C, sample constituents, or D, all of the above? So your poll has now started. I hope everybody is paying attention and answering the questions. Um, while you're doing that, I just would like to remind everybody that the chat function should be used if you're having technical difficulties, and the question um, tab is what you should be filling out when you have questions for um, the presenters. So 
hopefully everybody um, got that straight and filling out everything that they need to do here. We just have a few more seconds here. And we are done with that. I hope everybody completed their, their poll. And if we're done with that, we can go to the next slide. Yep, there we go. And the correct answer was D, all of the above. Okay, let's resume the second uh, subsection in section 2.4 is sample volume. So sample volumes are also based on regulatory program, analytical method, the target analytes of concern and laboratory specific protocols. Next slide. So what does that actually look like? Let's look at three examples. We'll begin with the safe drinking water program methods. These methods are prescriptive. They allow no modification. Safe drinking water methods define the sample volume, the container, the preservative, and the hold time. An example would be collection of <coughs> volatile organics in drinking water sample matrices by EPA method 524.3 as two or three 40 mil amber glass boa vials with Teflon lined caps preserved with ascorbic acid and HCl to a pH of two, cooled to four degrees centigrade with a hold time of 14 days. Next slide. And here's what those files look like. Next slide. Our second example, the wastewater program methods. These allow limited modification. The wastewater program methods define the sample volume, container, preservative, and hold time. Staying with our example of volatile organics collected in wastewater sample matrices by method 624.1 as two or three 40 mil boa vials, amber glass type with Teflon lined caps, preserved with sodium thiosulfate, cooled to four degrees centigrade, hold time of seven days or three days for the acrylon analyte. Next slide. And here's what those containers look like. You'll see the sticker declaring the pres preservation for this container. Next slide. Our third example are the water and waste methods. These are the SW846 compendium methods. The compendium provides guidance on sample volume, container, preservative, and hold time. Again, staying with the volatile organics, this time collected in non-potable water, by method six or 8260, collected as two or three 40 mil boa vials of amber glass type, secured with Teflon lined caps, preserved with HCl to a pH of two, cooled to four degrees centigrade with a hold time of 14 days. Next slide. And here's what those files look like. So we just reviewed three examples same constituent volatile organics collected with the same type of container. However, under three different regulatory programs. Next slide. Laboratory specific protocols for the compendium methods, SW846, may determine different sample volumes than the standard issue container, especially for non-potable water samples. So let's take a look at an example. Non-potable water samples collected for semi-volatile organic constituents by method 8270 can be collected first as two one liter amber glass containers 
Those are the standard issue containers for extractable organic constituents in a water sample. Second example would be two 250 mil amber glass containers for laboratories that have implemented a low volume approach. Next slide. Here we have a visual of the one liter standard issue containers, amber glass used for extractable organics in water. Next slide. Here we have a comparison of the one liter container in the back, the taller ones, and in the front, that 250 mil option that some laboratories have implemented. Next slide. A third option might be 150 mil container. Again, as compared to the one liter taller standard issue container in the back. So we just reviewed the semi-volatile organic constituents by method 8270 in a non-potable water collected as three different types of containers, one liter, 250 mil, 150 mil. Again, very important to check with your laboratory during project planning so that you're aware what you're gonna receive as your sampling kit and you're prepared in the field accordingly. Next slide. The color of the container. Analytical methods and target analytes basically inform the selection of container color choices. Choices include clear, amber, and opaque. Next slide. Colored containers do prevent photo degradation of the samples. Again, the main mission here is to maintain the integrity of that sample. Amber glass containers are used for organic parameters. Opaque plastic containers are used for collection of samples for metals, general chemistry, and PFAS parameters. It's important not only with the container being colored, but the samples themselves be protected from light at all times when practical during handling on site and shipping. Next slide. Color of container, amber glass boa vials, clear glass boa vials. Again, some laboratories may use the clear glass vials to assist the field sampler in easy detection of air bubbles during sample collection, which you do not want. The collection of the boa water sample should be completed with zero headspace. Next slide. So here's what that looks like. We have an auto sampler here showing amber glass boa vials in the back and in the front clear glass boa vials. Both are used by laboratories. Next slide. Container closures. This is our fourth topic in section 2.4. The closures themselves of the container form a leak proof seal, again, to maintain the integrity of that sample. Closure should be constructed of a material that's inert from the sample material. Closures may be specified by the analytical method. Examples include Teflon lined caps, sterile container seals. Next slide. Here's an example of a container closure, a sterile seal on a container used for microbiological sampling. Next slide. Sample container quality. This is our fifth topic in this section. Sample containers in general should be new, single use, pre cleaned, batch certified with documentation, traceable, and sourced from a trusted vendor. The exceptions may be containers that are multi used, they should be accompanied with cleaning documentation. Next slide. Stepping inside the laboratory, here's what that looks like. There's a variety of containers, again, used for collection of samples. This laboratory has sourced those containers from a trusted vendor. They come pre-preserved, they're labeled, and the technician is selecting the container and packing it for a specific order with an additional label 
allowing the field sampler to write you know, date, time, sample ID, et cetera. Next slide. Here we have a variety again of sample containers obtained from a trusted vendor with the stickers indicating the container type and perhaps even the pre-preservation information. Next slide. Here we have a close-up of the way the laboratory receives that container from that trusted vendor, indicating that there is pre-cleaning documentation associated with that lot number and that container number. The sticker also includes a type of container. This is amber glass, and it is a one liter container. Next slide. Sample containers should not be purchased from a retail outlet. They should not be altered or rinsed prior to use unless, with the exception we discussed, they're accompanied with pre-cleaning documentation. They should not be allowed to sit on the shelf in an equipment warehouse or an investigator's office for an extended time period. They should not be switched out, mixed up, or reused. Very important to order your containers specific to your project from your trusted laboratory supplier. Next slide. Here we have a visual of how the laboratory receives a pre-packaged kit from a vendor for collection of soil volatile organic samples. Next slide. Our sixth topic, chain of custody. The chain of custody form should accompany the samples beginning in the laboratory when the order is packed for a specific project, accompany that set of samples to the investigator's office and taken to the field and be shipped back to the laboratory. The form itself should list all the samples collected during the field event, including the field QC samples, which will be discussed in the next segment of this program. Chain of custody form should list the sample IDs on the sample bottles that are also listed on the chain of custody form. Next slide. Chain of custody is actually a record of the samples collected during that field event. The form itself signed becomes a legal document. Remember, samples are consumed by the laboratory during processing and residuals are disposed of after final data are reported. The signed chain of custody form is the remaining record of the existence of those samples. It's so important to be accurate and specific and understand that this becomes part of the evidentiary record of that project. Next slide. Chain of custody is actually a process. It begins with the field sampling team ordering the containers from the laboratory, receiving them, maintaining custody over that set of containers during sample collection, proceeding through sample transport from the field back to the laboratory and proceeding internally within the laboratory as the samples are processed. Custody actually ends with final disposal of the samples once the data are reported. Next slide. Our seventh of our eight topics in section 2.4, sample bottle storage and transport. So the sample bottles, both the empty kit received from the laboratory and the filled sample containers must be stored and transported in clean, secure environments under custody maintained by the authorized personnel. Field sampling teams are responsible for maintaining the integrity of the sample containers, both empty and filled, during that field sampling event. Samples should be transported back to the laboratory under clean, safe, custody secure conditions, whether that be a ground courier discharged by the laboratory or a third party carrier. Next slide. This is a visual of what goes on inside the laboratory when a customer calls for a project specific order and it is packed custom for that project. 
again, you'll see a clean, secure environment, and that begins the process. Next slide. Sample bottles and clean sampling equipment must not be stored near running vehicular exhaust pipes, solvents, gasoline, or other materials of potential sources of contamination, including food items. Sample bottle storage on site during the sampling event should be kept to a minimum. It's very important to be aware of your hold times for each sample collected and to avoid any extraneous contamination so that you maintain the integrity of those samples during your field sampling event and transport back to the lab. Next slide. Sample bottles are typically stored on site in a cooler at method defined temperatures, in Ziploc baggies, on wet ice, under chain of custody. An example would be cool that sample to zero to six degrees centigrade. Next slide. Here we have a visual of the types of coolers, large and small, used for your sampling events. Next slide. And here we have a visual of the cooler opened with sampling kits packed, ready for shipment to the site. Next slide. So our last of eight topics, 2.4.8, sample preservation requirements. Sample preservation is method defined. We, we saw a few examples in previous slides. First regulatory program that is very specific in defining uh, sample preservation with no modification allowed is the drinking water program. The second program of interest would be the wastewater program. The third program under regulatory is water and waste methods informed by the SWA compendium, which provides guidance on sample preservation. And the Next programs discussed are the radiological parameters and biological parameters. These have separate preservation requirements. Next slide. So there are appendices to section 2.4 that inform the sample preservation requirements. Again, the drinking water and wastewater methods are defined by uh, the Code of Federal Regu Regulations uh, 141 for drinking water and 136 for wastewater. And you will find links in Appendix 2.1 that direct you to the methods and preservation requirements for those programs. Sec Appendix 2.2 discusses radiological parameters and outlines sample preservation requirements for those parameters. Appendix 2.3 is a quick reference guide to some of the compendium SW846 uh, method sample preservation requirements for commonly requested parameters. Very important there to check with your laboratory as they may have laboratory specific protocols with a low volume container usage. And then appendices 2.4 and 2.5 address the collection of biological samples from freshwater, estuarine, and marine environments. Next slide. Again, the appendices provide quick reference guides, and it's very important to check with your laboratory during your project planning. Next slide. And I'll turn it back to the moderators. All right, thank you so much, Eileen. Um, we have a few questions here. So the First one is, what is the lifespan of an unused TerraCore sampling kit? Oh, that's a great if, if you happen to know that. Uh, the, the method itself, um, SW846 method uh, 5035, has not declared a quote, shelf life uh, for that type of container. But keep in mind, with sample integrity as your main goal, it's best not to let that container sit for too long. Okay, and the next question is, why is there a need to certify a firm for field parameters 
i.e. LF, PH, DO, etc., rather than just certification of the equipment being used. So I'll, I'll begin that and, and then maybe let Ryan or OQA uh, step forward. Think about it from the standpoint of uh, who, who, to who is that certification issued. Uh, the certification process, if you go on the link um, that is provided in the prior section, is very, very detailed. So the organization that receives that certification, think about that as an umbrella under which there are individuals performing tests. Those individuals are associated with that company to which that certification is issued. Each individual has to be, provide you know, documentation on their competence, essentially, to perform that individual test. So the certification is not issued to the person, it's issued to the company because there may be multiple individuals working for that company performing those tests, each having demonstrated their competence. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Um, I agree with everything you said there. I think the uh, question mentioned sort of of a certain instrument versus a person, I think. Um, two labs could be using the exact same instrument and demonstrate a huge difference in data quality produced uh, based on their own procedures and their oversight at the laboratory. Um, so that's why certification is granted to a laboratory specifically, uh, which includes the on-site audits and things um, to make sure that everything's being done correctly and uh, demonstrates that quality data is being generated. Okay, great, thank you both. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is for someone in DEP. It says, does the NJDEP plan to amend slash update NJAC 718 to include PFAS sampling and analysis? We are actually revising uh, 718 right now. Um, it's been a very long process and it still has a little ways to go after um, lawyers will review it and then it will be sent out for public comment. That's just a little side comment. So uh, don't hesitate to review that and get your comments in. As far as PFAS specifically, we don't really mention specific analytes in the regulations. They're more general. Um, you'll have to follow the method requirements for the method that you're certified in. Um, the only place you may see PFOS mentioned specifically it would be in subchapter 9, which is sample requirements. And in there, we have uh, details on holding times, container requirements, and things like that. Uh, we only include them when federal regulations are devoid of those requirements. Um, so you would be held to the requirements in 718 for those. As far as PFOS right now, I'm not certain if that is going to be singled out in any way in the new rule. So you'll have to stay tuned. But sample collection won't be in 718, more so handling. All right, the next question, I believe um, Eileen answered this during her presentation, but just to make sure, um, it says, VOAs for groundwater have almost always been clear. Is the AMBER a change in this manual? No, actually it's not a change. Um, again, uh, the slide that showed uh, inside the laboratory with the auto sampler with both sets of vials, the AMBER and the clear, um, I mean, it's common for one laboratory to only use amber or only use clear. It's also common, uh, depending on what uh, glassware supplier the lab uses, to receive both. Um, so the manual is not directing you to use one or the other. Again, back to our discussion of the overall regulatory program under which that groundwater sample is collected uh, and the regulatory uh, or, or the uh, laboratory methodologies that are informed um, by the set of methods. Uh, the compendium provides guidance and it does allow for modification, including the color of the container. 
So, so both are acceptable. The manual provides guidance, the field sampling procedures manual, and does not uh, direct you to select one container or another. Okay. Um, the next question is, won't the chemicals in a Teflon, Teflon lined cap pollute the sample in the bottle? Uh, well, that's, I mean, it's a good question. You basically have to take a look at what, what method is being applied to the sample in the bottle. What are the, anal the target analytes that that method allows you to determine? And is PFOS one of those target analytes? If, if you're not testing for PFOS, uh, then that Teflon lined cap uh, becomes irrelevant to the constituents you're testing for. Uh, for example, if you know if you're testing for metals and you're not testing for PFAS, uh, then a, a Teflon lined cap on a sample collected for metals uh, is not going to be a problem. Okay. Um, the next question is: The analytical discussion discussed the method, determined requirements, and procedures needed to be followed. How does this apply to then using a method for a different media than it was designed for? For example, using methods 537, 537.1, and 533, a drinking water method being used for non-drinking water media. Okay. This is a this is a great question. Really glad someone asked that. Um, so we get this question a lot <laughs> as to other laboratories that do uh, PFAS testing. First of all, um, method, uh, P there are two published drinking water methods for PFAS. 537.1, 537 was retired, so 537.1 and 533. Those are published drinking water methods. Back to our discussion of how those methods are applied, uh, laboratories are not at liberty to modify the method. It's strongly suggested that the field sampler not modify the method. Uh, so when you're taking a published drinking water sample that's or method that's very prescriptive and applying it to a non-drinking water sample, uh, therein, therein lies kind of the disconnect. Uh, so the difficulty uh, the field sampler might have is why, why do I need the chlorine buffer in here if this is not a finished drinking water sample? From the laboratory's perspective, it's best to, it's, it's best to set the container up as the method requires and send it to the field sampler with the preservation in there and have the field sampler not remove the preservation. Uh, Trisma is, you know, it's a chlorine buffer, essentially. If you don't have chlorine in your sample, it's not going to be an issue to have that preservative in there. Um, again, do not alter a published drinking water method that's prescriptive. Now, from the laboratory perspective, applying that drinking water method with the really tight QC windows to a non-drinking water sample, which may have you know, suspended solids, et cetera, in here, uh, does cause uh, reworks and um, the QC is outside the required windows. The laboratory can't report the results. They've got to go back and either uh, reanalyze the extract or go all the way back to the original sample and re-extract and reanalyze. And again, you kind of get into a, a rework loop uh, because the sample matrix and the method are essentially incompatible. Unless, until uh, the EPA draft method 1633 becomes finalized, uh, this, this is kind of the best situation we have uh, right now. Uh, is, and that's why a lot of the drinking water methods for PFAS are applied to non-drinking water samples because of the concern of you know, the lack of a published method. What I will say is the department uh, offers accreditation uh, for PFAS in a non-potable water sample matrix. Laboratories that are going that route are certified as a user-defined lab SOP approach. They're typically using isotope dilution, and that is a much better analytical approach for a non-potable water sample. 
So hopefully that, that answers the question. All right, the next question is three day TAT. I don't know if that's, if it's TAT or TAT for Acrolin was only mentioned in the 600s. Does that TAT for preserved VOCs analyzed for Acrolin also apply to SW846 method? And does that no longer apply to Acrolin nitrile? I'd have to go back and check um, whether 8260 has a shorter hold time. We're talking about hold time, not turnaround time. The hold time is really critical because when the sample is collected, the date and time, time that the sample is collected are documented on the, the label of the sample on the chain of custody form. That begins the hold clock. So the hold time is defined by the method. So I would have to go back and take a look at 8260 uh, to see what the hold time clock is uh, for Acrolin. Uh, but again, uh, the wastewater method uh, 624 uh, does have a specified hold time clock of three days for Acrolin, even in a preserved sample. So back to our discussion of you know, how long can I keep my samples on site before I have to send them back to the lab? Very important to take a look at the hold time for the method and for the constituents with that, within that method. Okay, and then the next question is, was the language pertaining to the 96 hour transport guidance removed from this update? That will be discussed in, in the next section, Michelle. Does the NJDEP still have a four day limit for containers once they leave the lab? That will be discussed in the next section. What is the difference between 600 and 800 methods? Good question, great question. The, the 600 series methods, we kind of loosely use that term. They also include um, the standard methods. Uh, we're, we're talking about the wastewater program. Uh, in, in New Jersey's world, that's the NGIPTES discharge permit program. Those methods are informed by the Clean Water Act, which was passed by EPA, and they are codified in uh, the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, we provide the link, Ryan, I think you had the link in section 2.3, and then we also have the link in appendix 2.1. So again, the 600 series, along with some of the standard methods, are part of the wastewater permit discharge program. That's the application. The 8,000 series methods are part of the compendium methods, SW846, and then the 8,000 series. Uh, so the compendium basically has uh, sections to it uh, that inform you know, the quality assurance requirements for the methods, um, the extractions, that are used, extraction or preparation step, and then the instrument um, and out analytical step. So the 8,000 series are fall under, in terms of applications, the site remediation program. So they are typically used by you know, the LSRPs and the field investigation staff for site remediation projects. They are part of the water and waste pro program. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, are LSRPs considered certified for sampling? Not, not unless they've gone through uh, the requirements that Ryan laid out in, uh, in, in the certification regs. Yeah, so the Office of Quality Assurance doesn't certify for sampling per se besides Private Well Testing Act sample collection, but we do certify for field measurements. So when those are used, you do need to be certified. But as far as collection procedures, um, I guess you could say low flow. We certify for those parameters, but in general, going out and collecting samples, no. Okay. All right, thank you. So I think that's all the time we have for questions. Yes, and it's now time for a break. So we will see everybody back in 10 minutes.
Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody back from the break. Um, is Sean ready to uh, present? Yes, Sean is ready. All right, thank you very much, Sean. Okay, uh, Go good ahead. morning, everybody. My name is Sean Clifford, and I am an LSRP with Brockerhoff Environmental Services. This morning, I will be speaking about Section 2.5, which details decontamination procedures, and Section 2.6, which details quality control samples. Proper and routine decontamination of sampling equipment is a critical component of a quality control program for all sampling conducted in the field. Having an established and effective decontamination procedure is also critical to providing an analytical data set which is representative of actual field conditions. Next slide. Insufficient decontamination may result in data which cannot be relied upon, development of a conceptual site model which is not accurate, and add significant additional costs and loss of time due to a need to go back and reevaluate site conditions. Next slide. Prior to implementation, the decontamination method should consider the potential for cross-contamination from the materials used in the process, as well as how to properly dispose of decontamination-related waste, which may be used. Decontamination procedures should include both equipment, which is used at multiple locations within a day, dedicated equipment which may remain in place for long periods of time. Next slide. So with respect to changes in the current field sampling procedures manual from the 2005 version, this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, but the sample equipment decontamination procedures have actually been moved to chapter five. So additional information on that will be announced in a future training session. So that is it for section 2.5. So I'm going to transition over to section 2.6, which details quality control samples. Next slide. So these are the subsections uh, that are part of section 2.6. I'll give everybody just a few moments to read those. Next slide. Quality control samples are intended to provide control over collection of environmental measurements and subsequent validation, review, and interpretation of generated analytical data. The use and function of quality control samples should be detailed in your quality assurance project plan or your field sampling plan. And I also want to point out uh, that the references discussed today in the quality control sampling in this presentation are with respect to field sampling and are not for certified lab requirements. Next slide. Quality control samples are critical to documenting an analytical data set, which is representative of actual field conditions, the efficacy of the decontamination procedures, the accuracy of the analytical data set, and if background conditions are impacting the analytical data set. Quality control samples can also provide multiple parties with analytical data in order to allow for independent review of investigation findings. Next slide. So these are the type of quality control samples that I'll be discussing today. Uh, they include trip blanks, field blanks, duplicate samples, split samples, and background samples. This is not an all-inclusive list. There are others such as temperature blank, reagent blank, and MSMSD. <laughs> the quality control sample de this definitions discussed today are from the field sampling procedure. Since this is a technical guidance document, it is intended to provide a reference for all environmental sampling conducted in New Jersey. And the definitions may differ from other programs, such as the EPA. In order to be clear, the function of the quality control samples should be detailed and defined in your quality assurance project plan or your field sample. Next slide. So now I'll go into detail on the different types of quality control samples. First one I'm going to discuss is the trip link. This is used to measure possible cross-contamination of samples during shipping to and from the site. This is prepared by the laboratory, travels with the other sample bottles into the field, is returned to the laboratory along with the collected samples for analysis of the same set of bottles they accompanied to in the field. 
it is critically important to note that only the laboratory should be opening trip length sample containers. Next slide. For your aqueous matrix for trip lengths, they are only required when the aqueous sampling events include volatile organic parameters pursuant to the specific analytical method. It should be included at a rate of one per sample shipment. However, certain contract requirements, such as the NJDEP or US EPA, may require additional trip lengths to be included. Next slide. <laughs> your non aqueous trip lengths uh, are not required unless specifically requested for by special, special analytical services or if required by the analytical method. Next slide. The next sample I'm going to discuss is the field blank, and this is used to place a mechanism of control on sample equipment and its related handling, preparation, storage, and shipment. It allows for an additional check on possible sources of contamination, such as ambient air, beyond which that is provided by the trip blanks. The field blank should be analyzed for all the same parameters that your collected samples will be analyzed for. And it's also important to remember the field blanks are generally not required for potable well sampling events or when a sample is collected directly from a source into a sampling container. Next slide. For your aqueous matrix uh, field blanks, the water provided by the analytical services laboratory is passed through the field sampling device and into an empty set of bottles. Or if you have no equipment, you pour the water from jar to jar in order to evaluate for potential cross-contamination from ambient air. These samples should be collected at a rate of 5% per analytical parameter per procedure. For sampling events lasting more than one day, field blanks should be collected at a minimum of one per day. Next slide. For your non-aqueous matrix field blank samples, you serve the same function as your aqueous samples, and at least one field blank should be collected. For sampling events lasting more than one day, they should be collected at a minimum of one. Next slide. Next quality control sample I'm going to discuss is your duplicate sample. And these allow for the evaluation of the laboratory and the field sampling team's performance by comparing analytical results of two samples from the same location. These should be collected for each matrix at a maximum rate of one for every 20 samples. If less than 20 samples are collected during the sampling episode, one duplicate should be collected. Next slide. For your aqueous matrix and duplicate samples, they should be obtained by the collection of one sample and splitting it into separate sample containers. Consideration is needed to ensure that sufficient sample volume is collected and when sampling for volatile organics. Next slide. For your duplicate sample for the non aqueous matrix, uh, these samples, when it, to be analyzed for volatile organics, should be taken from discrete locations or intervals and without compositing or mixing the sample. And that's done in order to prevent loss of contaminant mass. For your non-volatile organic samples, the sample volume should be put into a decontaminated container, homogenized with a decontaminated instrument, and then the sample container should be alternately filled. Next slide. Uh, the next sample I'm gonna be talking about is a split sample. It's also sometimes known as a field split. Split samples can allow for independent evaluation of analytical data by different parties. Split samples should be collected in the same manner as detailed for duplicate samples. And when doing split samples, you should consider utilizing different laboratories for analysis of each party's samples. With respect to frequency, split samples are on an as-needed basis. Next slide. Background samples, such as the type for the evaluation detailed in 726E 3.8 when conducting a natural background investigation, allow for a comparison of site conditions to the surrounding environment. These samples should be collected in the same manner as other samples. Next slide. So I'm gonna discuss now some of the considerations which should also be made when developing your quality control sample program. Uh, first consideration is blank water quality. Your trip and field blanks must utilize laboratory provided contaminant free water and must be from the same as the method blank water used by the laboratory performing the specific analysis. So, this means not getting your blank water from a supermarket or any other source in the laboratory. Not that that would ever happen in the field. Next slide. 
Another consideration is sample management. Quality control samples should be stored in the same manner and in accordance with the applicable requirements as your other samples. Hold times need to be factored in when including your quality control samples. Site remediation and waste management program rec recommends that the quality control samples not be held on site in excess of four days. And I will have more on that in a few slides. Next slide. <laughs> Additional uh, considerations with sample holding times is your quality control samples should have the same holding time as your other samples. And it's critical to remember that the holding clock starts when the sample is collected into the, in the field. Next slide. Now, the final consideration is with specialty methods and as part of your project planning, any special methods used in the analysis of samples should be included in part of the quality control evaluation. Next slide. So with respect to changes in the current field sampling procedures manual from the 2005 version, the 2005 field sampling procedures manual states, field and trip lengths must travel with the sample containers and must arrive on site within one day of their preparation in the lab. Blanks and their associated samples may be held on site for no longer than two calendar days and must arrive back in the lab within one day of sam sample shipment from the field. This constitutes the maximum four day handling time. However, the current field sampling procedures manual states, site remediation and waste management program recommends that quality control samples not be held on site in excess of four days. But you have to keep in mind that some of your analytical methods may have shorter holding times. So that actually concludes the presentation for sections 2.5 and 2.6. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, we have a test your knowledge question. Remember, you need to answer these questions to be eligible for CECs. Uh, so this is a true or false. You can use tap water for a blank water sample, true or false. So you will have about a minute to answer this question. Make sure you're answering so you can get your CECs. And in addition, uh, remember that the SurveyMonkey link was in the chat and it will go out in the chat again um, before the presentation is over. So please fill that out. It really helps us uh, figure out what to do next and how to really cater these uh, trainings to the audience. And then in addition, I think we answered most of the questions from before, but if we did not, we will get um, a question to you via email. So don't worry if the question was not answered out loud during the presentation, we will not forget about it. Um, so it looks like a lot of you have voted. We're about 88% right now. We'll give you all a few more seconds. Make sure you get an answer in there. It doesn't have to be correct, just to get credit for your CECs. All right, so the poll is going to close in a few more seconds. Okay. I believe we are going to go into another question portion now. Yes, we are. And there's the answer, it was false. <laughs> Most of you got right. Okay, so we're gonna be ask, asking some questions now. Um, if this will be the last time we'll be having questions right now, so I'll be going through these. Um, I believe this has been answered, but we're gonna ask it again. Um, was the language pertaining to the 96 hour transport guidance removed from this update? Yes, yeah, well, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was modified. So, yes, yeah, so now uh, it's recommended that your, uh, all your samples and your QC samples not be held on site in excess of four days. Um, so that's a recommendation, or it was referenced as must, um, because that wasn't supported with the regulation. <laughs> it was uh, uh, modified to recommend. And does the DEP still have a four day limit for containers once they leave the lab? So that, 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 yeah, that would fall into that same uh, thing. It's, it's a recommendation uh, that, you know, they return to the lab within the months. Okay. What situation requires field blank samples for non aqueous sampling event? You provided contradictory comment in a presentation. First, you said not required and then indicated required for non aqueous per 2.6. 2.1.2 frequency field blanks for the non aqueous matrix should be performed at a rate of one per day. Should I say so, that again, Stella? 
Yeah, please. Sorry. So what situation requires field blank samples for non-aqueous sampling events? Is it required one per day or do we not have a requirement? Uh, it's it, one per day or one per 20 uh, and a minimum of one per day. Thank you. Are field and trip blanks always required? Um, I guess maybe we would answer that question offline because um, I would just want to uh, confer with some of the people that on this chapter on this one. Okay, if anybody I want, else- I don't want to give out a wrong wants, answer on that one. I hear that. If anybody else from DEP wants to jump, jump on, they can. Um, oh, there we go. Not from DEP, but go ahead. Actually, this is Eileen Snyder from the lab perspective. Um, drinking water methods, Again, they're very prescriptive and they do outline requirements for trip blanks. Some of the methods such as PFAS call this blank a field reagent blank. So again, back to Sean's point about the terminology here, um, it's the field reagent blank in the PFAS world associated with those published prescriptive drinking water methods, um, the field reagent blank accompanies the sampling containers to the field and is collected slightly differently than the field sample, but still has to be performed uh, as part of that sampling uh, event. Drinking water methods contain information about trip blanks and or field reagent blanks that are specific to the method must be followed for the method to be considered valid. And Other I just want to follow up. I just just uh, double check. So the the frequency for the trip blanks and the field blanks is it's uh, it's referenced as recommended and should. Uh, so that means that um, at least for the sampling that's that's detailed here in the field sampling procedures manual, they're recommended. But as Eileen said, for some things they are required. So this is again goes back to the importance of having a, a quap and a field sampling plan in place. This, this is where you would define um, if you're going to have this. Yeah, and if I can jump in again uh, from the lab perspective, um, it, it, going back to the slides that that Ryan provided in section for section 2.3, um, developing your quality assurance project plan based on your data quality objectives is your starting point. Your regulatory program really informs so much of what you're doing in turn all the way down to the analytical method that's selected, the container, the hold time, any requirements for you know trip blank, field blank, field reagent blank, et cetera. So it's very important to understand the regulatory framework that you're working under take a look at specific target analytes of concern, uh, the methods the laboratory may use to determine those, and then take a look at your field QC requirements. Thank you both. Are non-aqueous field blanks analyzed for just VOCs or for the same parameters as the environmental samples? So, uh, it's so is, was the question, are they just required for VOCs? Are non-aqueous field blanks analyzed for just VOCs or for the same parameters as the, as the environmental samples? Should be the, the same parameters as the environmental samples. Thank you. Um, for trip blanks, you said one per shipment. If we are sending two coolers to the lab on the same day, do we, um, do we need only one? Uh, yeah, so the, the previous uh, field sample procedures manual version referenced uh, sample shuttles. I believe that was taken out of this one. Uh, so the frequency is, uh, is, it states, is included at a rate of one per sample shipment. Um, so it's not saying, you know, if you have three coolers, um, you know, it has to be in all those coolers. And, and obviously you would, you know, if that's the case, maybe you'd want to condense your VOCs into one cooler. But it doesn't specify it has to be one per cooler in the current uh, field sample procedures manual. Um, it just states it has to be one per ship. 
Thank you. This field sampling procedures manual wording has been confusing regarding analytical parameters for non-aqueous field blanks. Some people have interpreted the wording to mean that non-aqueous field blanks are not required unless VOCs are being sampled for. Please clarify or confirm that the field blanks are always needed for non-aqueous samples and should be analyzed for all parameters being sampled for. <laughs> yeah, my understanding is that they, they should be, uh, the, the field blanks should be uh, analyzed for all the same parameters that you're sampling. Is the DEP working on or going to request any new, new, I'm not, I don't even, under, uh, Chris Buck, can you please uh, restate your question? I don't understand it. Um, moving on. Um, regarding field blank for non-aqueous remains contradictory, I would like written clarification. Um, that's okay. Mr. Patel, we will get back to you. Um, there used to be a requirement for P um, PDBs to have a higher duplicate rate, one per 10 samples. Can PDBs now follow an item, um, the one per 20 rate? PDDs? That's what it said, PDB. It, so, it sounds, Lynn, like passive, passive diffusion yeah. bag, PDB. Okay. So the passive diffusion bag that you drop in the well and allow it to, uh, you know, equilibrate, and then you pull it, you know, a week or two later, and it you, you sample for your volatile organics. Yes, they confirmed it is passive diffusion bags. So, th so the question is the frequency of the triplanks. Is that the question? Uh, the question is, are non-aqueous field blanks? Um, Oops, wrong one, sorry. Are there, um, ah, I lost this one second. There used to be a requirement to have a higher duplicate, duplicate rate, one per 10 samples. Can we now follow for the passive um, diffusion bags um, that rate or just do we have to follow the one per 20 rate? What rate do they have to use? For the duplicate That's, samples, one per ten or one per twenty. For the duplicate, or are we talking about the field uh, or the uh, passive diffusion bag samples? It says there used to be a requirement for the passive diffusion bags to have a higher duplicate rate of one per ten samples. Can they now follow the one per twenty rate? So the passive diffusion bags aren't specified in Chapter Two, so I would use the uh, the rate that's detailed here in Chapter Two. Okay. Um, are non-aqueous field blanks analyzed for just VOCs or the same parameters as the environmental samples? I think we answered that. Um, okay, so the, the question is, are there going to be any new proficiency tests other than the current pH condu conductivity and turbidity? Uh, that that might be a question. That actually, Ryan probably answered that question. Who are you uh, referring to? Oh, there we go, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. So, any new proficiency tests besides pH conductivity and turbidity? I think was the question. Um, if there is a proficiency test offered for an analyte that a lab is certified for, then they have to participate in a proficiency testing study. So, there's many many different ones offered. Um, some things are not, like dissolved oxygen, that's not practical, it doesn't work, so there is no PT required for those. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we have addressed the questions that I see here. If I've missed one, um, I apologize, and we will reply, as we said earlier, to um, your questions in writing um, for those who have requested it. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Crystal. <laughs> Welcome okay. back, Crystal. Thanks, Lynn. The last section that we will be discussing is 2.7 and its quality assurance for emerging contaminants. Next slide. 
Quality assurance requirements for emerging contaminants may require special attention during project planning and execution. It's very important that you work with your certified laboratory during project planning. The analytical method, sample container, and holding times may be different. You need to evaluate potential for cross-contamination, and you need to consider sample collection and handling. Next slide. In the field sampling manual, we do not specifically address individual contaminants. So the best place for the most up-to-date information for these specific contaminants would be the DEP Emerging Contaminants website, as well as the EPA website. Next slide. And if you had specific questions about the Emerging Contaminants Analytical, you can contact Greg Toffoli. Um, and this is his email address. That's how he prefers to be contacted. Next slide. So that concludes our training for chapter two. Um, it also concludes chapter one, three, and four. And I wanted to thank the work groups for all their hard work on these chapters. What's next for the field sampling? We are currently doing chapters five and six. We're going through all the comments that were received from the outside comment period. We have about 624 comments to go through. Um, this will also be the next training that we will provide. We are also working on chapters seven, eight, and nine, and that will also be trained with five and six. Next slide. All right, thank you so much, Crystal. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, just a reminder, I'm sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to say for the few questions that we did just get, the um, current field sam the chapters that we just went over have been published and are online for you to use now. Sorry for interrupting, Alyssa. It's all good. Okay, so um, just a reminder to fill out the course evaluation. The link will be put in the chat. Um, those surveys are really important to us. As Crystal said, there's going to be more field sampling procedure manual trainings coming up, so keep an eye out for those. And we just wanted to thank you for coming today. And um, just remember, you will be getting some information about CECs if you are eligible, so keep an eye out for that as well. I hope everyone has a good day, and we'll see you soon. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.